You may be wondering, oh, he looks different this week. Because yes, I got engaged. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Ajay Patel Show. My name is Ajay Patel. And yes, I did it. I finally did it. Three and a half, probably three and some change years later, I finally did it. I I have mentioned Isha a handful of times on this episode. Sorry, not this episode, on this show quite a bit. Uh, I started dating her back in 2020 and this past Monday, which is the reason for why I did not release an episode last week, this past Monday, uh, March 11th. So whatever day this comes out, just backdate it to that. Uh, I proposed. I finally did it. Now, it's a strange feeling. You know, like I'm not in, in way, no way am I trying to make this negative in any point, but you know, it's a feeling of high elation. You're pumped up on dopamine. Oh my gosh, everyone's so happy. And it's a strange feeling because it's like in this lifetime, you hope not to have too many proposals, right? Is that a general idea? Like, hey, I hope I don't have to either propose too many times or I hope I don't have to get proposed to too many times. Maybe it's some, some old school way of thinking. Maybe in modern days and in five, 10 years, 20 years, it'll be more of a normal thing where people have five of these. You don't want to lose the high that it is. It's just like anything, right? You go have some fast food. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. You have it the next day. Ah, this ain't feeling too good. You have it three days in a row. Mm, now I'm for sure sick. Anytime you have something that good that often, it loses its feeling, you know? And when it comes to proposing, I will say, look, I was someone of the camp that I was like, oh, you know what? When I do it, it's going to be simple. You know, like, I won't, I won't be that nervous. I'm going to be cool as a cucumber. I'm, I'm a pretty level-headed guy. I'm not too outwardly emotional. So when I do this, shit, I don't need no help. I got this. Sure enough, boy, oh boy, was I wrong. Boy, oh boy. Like, okay, look, leading up to it, here's one thing that I definitely... Actually, honestly, each part of it, I underestimated. I underestimated how much work goes into ring shopping. I underestimated how much work goes into uh, the process of doing that with your partner. Because in my head, it was a it was such a strange feeling, right? Of like, oh, let's go do this ring shopping thing. And essentially, you know that this is going to happen, right? You know this proposal is going to happen. So there is like you almost have the part of the proposing part. You actually have the part where the guy gets on a knee. It's so theatrical, you know? This was my point of view before, where it's just like, oh, why do people even do this? Honestly, why do why did people, why do people even do this? You guys have already talked about getting married. You guys have already talked about how many kids you want. You, you go through so many of these conversations before the question of will you marry me even comes about. Shit, nowadays, it, people don't even say, will you marry me? All these signs, I don't know whether it's a save money kind of thing, but if you show up to someone's proposal and you'll see that, like, let's say they have a heart of rose petals around this little area, maybe a few candles, and they, they'll never have the letters, will you marry me? Sorry, the words, will you marry me? Now it just says, marry me. Isn't that wild? Like, there is no, and this was my quarrel with proposing in general, where it's like, there is no, there is no surprise to it. But then after going through it myself, you actually realize the surprise that it is. And I will say, when I initially left the house, and I'll tell you guys in a second how it all went down. When I left the house, my stomach was in absolute knots. I really didn't think this would happen. I thought, you know, okay, I may, I may get a little nervous, you know, just a couple butterflies, like as if you were about to go up on stage and do a speech, do a dance, whatever, just, to, you know, some of those normal butterflies. But when you're sitting in a car driving around and music isn't playing and you're just driving as fast as you freaking can and you're ignoring all calls, you're not looking at your phone and you're just focused. Your stomach is in knots. You don't even feel like eating. You don't feel like drinking. 
that feeling doesn't just happen. And I'm not trying to get too cheesy with this, right? Like, I will say it was like, uh, like going to a club, you know, you wait in line at this club and you're like, damn, I can't wait to get in. Eventually, I will get into this club. For now, I'm seeing all the snaps of people in this club and I'm like, damn, they're having fun. It looks like they're having a great time in there. The music's good. The women are attractive. The dudes are attractive. The alcohol ain't that bad. It looks like a fun time in there. But you know what? I'll wait. I'll wait in this line. And then eventually, you know, sometimes people are just like, oh, you know, this club ain't even that great. This club ain't even that great. We can go down the street to this place over here. Oh, hey, you know, the bouncer said you, you wearing sneakers, so we won't be able to get in. Oh, okay, yeah, whatever. I, I didn't even want to go to this club anyways. That thinking is never right. Never, ever, ever right. Because as soon as you get into that club, all those snaps you saw, they were real. They were real. And I felt the same way about proposing, where I was just like, you know, like, I don't see the excitement behind it. The converse, there are so many conversations that happen beforehand now where it's like, I know this person is going to say yes. But almost it, it's like, what, what's it called? Uh, a double-edged sword, catch-22, whatever metaphor or simile you want to use here, where it's just like, probably for good reason. You know, like a lot of relationships that start off pretty young, like let's say they get engaged three months in. Sometimes it's like, damn, have y'all even had any of those conversations? Have you guys talked about marriage, family value, whatever your list of criteria may be? Now, I have been someone that has always been a proponent of arranged marriage as well. I've always seen a beauty in, oh, I will learn to love this person. Obviously, you don't really know a lot about the person. But this is also, like I said, a little bit of old school thinking where it's like there is a North Star when you get into this relationship. When this guy and this girl come together. Or guy, guy, girl, girl, whatever, don't cancel me, just relax. When this couple comes together and it's been arranged and they don't know each other, the only thing that really gets checked off is like, Okay, we approve of this family. And same way the other way around. Now, there will be this North Star. The couple will move to America, have kids, send the kids to college, and uh, hopefully succeed in the American dream. Now, that has changed quite a bit. Obviously, being a first generation, whatever generation American I am, everything changes. You're much more westernized in your approach. And honestly, even in those countries that regularly do arrange marriage, they have gotten much more westernized. The approach has changed everywhere. So in proposing, let's get into the story stuff of it. Originally, 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 I wanted to propose on February 29th. I thought there was something cool about having not nothing around like, oh, you know, we can only celebrate every four years. Nothing like that. But it was just something cool about having that date, a date that doesn't even exist in some years. Can y'all hear that car honking? Anyways, I want to do it February 29th, but then I, I'm a big procrastinator. And I put behind ordering the ring. Got to order the ring. And I was going through originally, I was going through Brilliant Earth because I had found this place in Uptown Village in Dallas. Sorry, West Village in Dallas. And I was like, okay, you know, the price ain't bad. I'm, I'm going to get something that looks like this. Luckily, I had one of her friends. No, I didn't have her at all. The friend actually helped me out tremendously. Anushka took her originally to uh, ring shopping. So you get a general idea, right? Because Isha, in this scenario, she didn't really know what she wanted. Because if you don't aspire, like, you know, if you don't really have an inclination of, oh, I want this. I want this all natural. I want this carrot. I want this shape going into it. You don't really know until you actually start trying stuff on. So Anushka helped tremendously with that, where it was just like, okay, now you have a general idea. And then another friend, Hanali, took her ring shopping. Now, I thought this was my bad. This was my bad. I thought that was it. You know, I thought, hey, you know what? Friends do it. And then they just send me details. And then I go do the transaction. That was wrong. That was wrong. 
I should have offered. I should have offered. My bad. So then eventually her and I go ring shopping. I get a general idea. I see some. Oh, so I guess a quick shout out. We went to Vrai, V-R-A-I, however you pronounce that. I apologize. Right here in uh, Beverly Hills. And the prices were about the same to um, Brilliant Earth. But something that I like in shopping, and I think probably a lot of people, is like when you physically see the tangible product, especially when you're spending that dollar amount where you're like, okay, you know, I've touched it, I've seen it, I can approve of this, versus where you go through a third party and you haven't really seen what you're buying. And I was texting some third parties, but then I was just like, you know what, forget this, I need to hurry this shit up. I ended up ordering it probably end of February, it doesn't come in till the first week of March, and then Isha was scheduled to leave town for a handful of weeks. So I was like, you know what? I got to do this now. I got to do this now. So she, we had plans for the weekend. She had to go to San Diego on Sunday. Um, and I was like, should I do it when she gets back? Because we've already had the conversation, just like every other conversation, where it's like, this would be my ideal proposal slash engagement. Because a lot of people, you know, I think the normal cadence you'll see is you see a proposal and then that either already has all the friends and family there. And then either that happens or a proposal happens. And then the couple drives over to where all the friends and family are. Woo, big celebration. It's like a mini reception. It's like a party with no ties, you know, like that party is probably one of the most fun parties. It's a smaller amount of people. You're super close friends. Feelings are at an all-time peak. It's a fun time. But in our scenario, we didn't want that. And I was perfectly good with it. So my ideal place would have been somewhere in Malibu. Nothing beachside. I don't like dealing with sand. Like even in thinking about where I would have a wedding, sand, I, I just not, I'm just not a big fan of sand. It gets too many places. Uh, for old people, it's hell to walk through. If you got a kid, you got to carry him because you have to have proper wheels on your uh, stroller to get through the sand. I'm not a big sand guy. I do like going to the beach. I'm not a big sand guy when it comes to events like this. So I wanted to find like this patch of grass, just somewhere scenic in Malibu. Didn't really have time. Or maybe let's say I just didn't take the time to do it. So then the idea came, you know what? During this time of the year, the sun sets perfectly from an angle where you can see it on our balcony. So I'll do it there. Location has been set. Next up, so I got the ring. I got location. Outfits, I'll just kind of wing that. And then everyone always talks about it. You gotta get her nails did. So this part was actually one of the more difficult parts because if you're a guy and you say, hey, we should go get our nails done or hey, would you like me to pay for you to get your nails done? She already knows. She already knows. She already knows. It already gives it up. So essentially, let me speed this up a bit. All in all, how I went about it is I basically set up an almost scavenger hunt where it was just uh, note cards of instructions. So the first note card was, hey, you have a nail appointment at this place at this time. Here's my credit card. So then from that first note card, you kind of already know. I had left the house and I sent her like one last text message where I was like, hey, I won't be texting you again. But this note card was left or sorry this envelope will be found on my desk please go read it now and then from there she ended up going to the wrong nail place but that's that's the thing for another episode eventually she gets back to the place during that time where she was out uh doing her nails i cleaned the whole balcony up put out a new rug you know made it presentable put out some market lights candles all this stuff photographer didn't have one I set up a tripod. I set up a tripod just like this. And I recorded the whole thing. I I was stressed a bit about finding someone because I was like, oh, should I get a drone? You know, should I get someone to do this and that? And then I was like, you know what? F it. Keep it simple and keep it pretty. Like put thought into it, but don't stress yourself out about things that 
ultimately won't make the biggest change in the event. So then she eventually comes back home. I propose. And just like that, just like that, it happened. It went down. I did it. So then after that, you know, like, uh, since we did not have any plans afterwards, you know, we didn't have plans to go see a big group of people. It was just like, hey, we have these dinner reservations. You're, you're feeling elated. You're doing the FaceTime calls to the parents, the siblings. And then uh, we avoided doing any friends the night of, except for the friends that already knew that were kind of helpful with the process. Uh, main people that I want to give a shout out to, Hanali, Natasha, and Asha, and obviously people that all played a factor. I'm sorry if I didn't name you. Um, so we do all the FaceTime calls and then we waited the next day. We were a bit hung over the next day where it's just like, it's slow. You slowly get into it because you're also working on a Tuesday. So you're doing some work, you're laying down, chilling, and then you do some FaceTime calls, all of that, all of that. And then you kind of start thinking about all the stuff to come. I've been talking about this for a fat minute. I've been talking about this for a fat minute. I just saw the time and I'm I'm at the 17 minute mark of just talking about this. So I'm definitely going to chop this up and hopefully just keep in the stuff that matters or that is at least a little bit more entertaining. Um, so you do the proposal. And just like I said, it's like you finally get into the club. You finally get into the club. And then I think on Wednesday night, so a couple of days after, we, we just kick it. We just kick it, take some gummies, have a couple of drinks and just kick it at home. You know, like you don't always have to do all the fanfare. Just because everyone else is doing it doesn't mean you have to, especially when it comes to something like a proposal. Execute things how you want to. I think both of us coming from younger siblings, in addition to being probably more on the later end of our friend group of doing all of this, you kind of get that luxury. You kind of get the luxury of, oh, I don't have to do this grand thing. Everyone's already seen the magic trick so many times. And then I'm going to do the same trick and expect people to applaud me. I'm good. You know what? I'm going to I'm going to do this trick my way and let's see how it goes. So it was cool. And then the thought of kind of just like all the events that follow this. It is a pretty wild thing to think about. The level of commitment from and look, I'm not trying to sound too cheesy about this. The level of commitment from that boyfriend girlfriend step to let's say fiance, I don't know if it feels different from fiance to actually being married married. It might be a 2% difference, but that's a big ass 2%. Because then you start thinking about all the events that follow. You know, being Indian, you have a bunch of stuff. You don't just plan a 50 person wedding, a little reception that follows that. You don't do that. You have to have this puja, then maybe another puja in another city. And then you also have to maybe go visit these people. And then you have to have four wedding events and then you got to get court married like there's a lot of things and when you start thinking about that and you know we started having the conversation of should we have an engagement party should we have an engagement party and start inviting people you know invite the immediate let's say family and friends we started listing it out and i just started instantly getting stressed out in my head i was like you know what it'll be easy same thing as proposal where it's like, oh, I'm not going to be nervous. And then next thing you know, you're nervous as shit. Throughout the process of all of it, I will say doing an early unveil unveiling where it's like, you know, this proposal is about to happen ahead of time. Your nerves kind of dwindle down. So when the moment comes, you are nervous and you're very emotional, but you can at least speak. So same thing with finally realizing that emotion on the other side of the fence. You finally cross and then you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to have this event, this event, this event, this event. Now, remember, I said I took some gummies, but this is how I normally think. Pretty high anxiety, but it's just me. Where it almost feels like I've been to a handful of weddings and a handful is being generous about it. I've been to a shit ton of weddings, a bunch of weddings, a bunch of proposals, uh, yeah, so I've been part of this movie for a long time. And so it almost feels like, and here's my last metaphor for the day, I think, where you're sitting in an audience and you're just watching this on a big screen, where you watch, you know, 
everyone applaud the couple entrance, the dances, the outfits, all the families coming together. Wow, this is such a happy movie I'm watching. That, those, that couple must be ecstatic about what's to come or what they're going through right now. And then the thought of being that person about, oh shit, I'm going to have this audience now watching me up there do all this. It was a pretty wild that started to slow, pretty wild idea that slowly started to just sink in. And what's strange to think about is like, I'm someone that does love the attention, right? Like I do love being on stage, doing this or that, whether it was dancing back in the day, telling jokes, emceeing. Uh, I think that's about it. Don't really sing. I liked the attention. I like entertaining people. Why do you think I'm talking to a iPhone in the abyss of an empty apartment? It's to entertain. But the thought of the wedding aspect where it's like all your family comes together because this is what they've been looking forward to. All those years leading up where they were like, hey, you know what? When, when is your wedding? When is your wedding? When is your wedding? You might have been getting annoyed, but for them, that is, you know, a, an excuse. That is almost a milestone where it's like, damn, I used to change that dude's diapers. I used to change that little boy's diapers. That little boy that's 6'4", I used to change that dude's diapers. And now that man's getting married. It's a wild thought. So that thought slowly started to sink in. And then it's just like, damn, you know what? This is a much bigger process. And I did realize what it was because I have an older sister that got married. But it's just different when you think about it that all of this is happening for you. On that note, special shout out to Isha Patel. Thank you guys for listening. If you did listen to all 23 minutes of it or however many minutes it was. And now let's get into some other topics. They tried to cancel Jay Shetty. They adjust my volume here for a second. Testing. Okay. They try to cancel Jay Shetty. <laughs> they try. They are trying to cancel Jay Shetty. Let me find an article so I can just read something verbatim so I don't spew out some nonsense. Shetty, the author of best-selling books, Think Like a Monk, Eight Rules of Love, falsely claimed to have spent three years, falsely claimed to have spent three years in a temple in India. The host of the popular On Purpose podcast, whose guests have included the likes of Michelle Obama and other celebrities, has also concealed his past affiliation with the Hare Krishna sect, members of which were accused of child sexual assault and corporal punishment, it was reported. I don't know about the sexual assault stuff, so all the jokes I have going forward, please leave that out of your mind. But basically, the, the, the story is this. Jay Shetty lied on his resume. He lied on his resume. And he got caught. Am I ready to cancel Jay Shetty now? <laughs> no, bro. I keep telling y'all, this, this cancel movement that y'all think is happening, it's not happening. It's not happening. The same, look, look at what happened to Hassan Minaj. Some, uh, someone started digging into his stories. They found out he lied. But he's good. He's still selling tickets. I think he's on tour right now. Jay Shetty, same thing. This man has books. This man has a podcast. This man does public appearances. You're not going to cancel him because he lied on his resume. Most of y'all have Microsoft Excel on your resume right now. And if I ask you to do a pivot table, and when I say y'all, I mean myself too. If someone asks you to do a pivot table, you won't know how to do that. You didn't save your company $10,000. You didn't help conversion increase by 5%. You didn't do any of that. You didn't lead a team of five people. You didn't do anything. You were working from home doing your laundry. You lie on your resume just like everyone else. Same thing with Jay Shetty here. My man, look, I, I don't really indulge in all his stuff, right? I am appreciative for what he is as part of the movement. Like the dude interviews Michelle Obama. I don't know if he did Barack Obama. He has all the stars on his podcast. And this is a dude that used to work in a temple. What? Like, also, who is this person that's digging into everyone's lives? Like, do we not have anything better to do than like, oh, you know what? I'm going to find some shit on him. Plagiarized reports, uh, lied about past. 
like who no one do y'all care about this do y'all were y'all listening to the podcast and then you were like oh he wasn't actually a monk let me not listen to this anymore cancel culture has changed man it's not the same it's not the same look we went through this wave of the me too movement very much needed to get these nasty ass dudes out of here and what we're realizing now which is a segment for another episode is there's still some nasty dudes out there that we need to lock up canceling people over lying bro that list is going to get quite extensive i fully support lying on your resume you think when i apply to acting gigs or i apply to stand-up spots i don't fabricate some stuff no one wants the inexperienced person to be teaching them about love no one wants them teaching them oh you you only went to monday for one year you only went to the temple for one year and you want to teach me about peace i think i might be better suited than you but you say, tell someone hey i spent 10 years in a monastery in the in the mountains of india oh shit! tell me more tell me more you see it's a hook just like that why why would you not do that like the same way these people are selling stuff on TikTok left and right oh look at me look at this accessory that i have isn't it awesome then you buy the accessory and you're like wow this is a piece of shit. this is horrible this person lied to me and yes i understand if that happens then you're like oh you know what maybe i won't trust their stuff anymore sure but look at this this guy's already climbed the mountain he's already up there what is canceling going to do to him canceling like like i said like i said the me too movement was much needed now we've gotten to this thing of just like two two aspects here two aspects here one it takes a lot for someone to get canceled now two we've almost just been exhausted of it like the cancel culture movement has almost halted in a sense or it's to the point where it's like we've heard so many stories that now when we want to cancel someone it's got to be outrageous outrageous oh you did what now you get out of here nothing has happened from that epstein list look at look at pete diddy all that stuff's coming out about him he's still walking around look at how much it took to get r kelly behind bars look how much it took to get bill cosby behind bars this cancel and look like i said that nickelodeon stuff is gonna come out to be much more popular soon you guys should watch it on hbo max i'm going to talk about it soon not right now but it takes a lot to get canceled now hustle minaj lied about some jokes no one really cared it was just it was there was more comedy in the fact that this was getting reported than the fact that we're getting angry at it the dude he's a monk he wasn't he wasn't your dad he was like like what are y'all talking about why why are we upset about this you are out of your mind if you think monks look like that go to your local temple all my brown people or if you're not brown go find a local temple Take your shoes off at the entrance and walk in and just sit on the floor and and just face forward and just just look at the people that work there just look at the people that work there you'll see maybe three guys i'm not sure i'm not sure i i personally at the temple that i have gone to growing up and still go to when i'm in town here and there it's just guys you'll see three dudes more than likely they've aged significantly because they have been doing this for about 40 years they stay relatively active they're up on their feet all day they're not really staring at phones but i'll go ahead and tell you this they don't have colored eyes they don't look like jay shetty if one of the 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 priests from my mundir came on down and started trying to sell books y'all be like who the hell is this but because he's pretty we like him and it's okay that's the point be pretty get liked what's wrong with that seriously i know y'all think i'm joking here but it's like we would not be listening to this dude if he didn't have colored eyes and had a beautiful wife and they were decent people that we that we know of we wouldn't care and we still don't like he's still out there doing interviews nothing has slowed down so this cancel culture thing like i truly think like small stuff like this is good for clickbait because it's like oh snap you know like 
someone up there was lying about what they were doing. And it's a good shock value, but it doesn't turn into anything. I had to take another sip before I mention the man that's everyone's been trying to cancel. Look at Donald Trump. Everyone has been trying to cancel him. And it's gotten to the point where people have started to like him now. Just announced maybe about a week or two ago, the final folks for the election will be Joe Biden and Donald Trump. I am personally of the belief that this should never happen, right? This should ne- they should ne- we should never have a rematch. We should always present new blood. I think there should be an age limit thing, but I don't know what it is. Biden just gave his State of the Union address. Now, as much as we make fun of Joe Biden, Sleepy Joe, this old dude who doesn't really know what's going on, I will say that speech, pretty invigorating, man pretty invigorating it was like damn who wrote this did jay shetty write this who wrote this speech because oh my gosh i don't look you go go talk to one of the older people in your community or in your family that's 80 plus years old and ask them to talk to you i guarantee you they're either going to forget what they've been talking about after five minutes in or they're going to be like ah whatever and then move on to something else this man joe biden gave that entire State of the Union address. I didn't listen to all of it, but from what I heard of, and I gave it at least like a 20 minute listen, solid. I truly think there's it's either something, whether it's an artificial brain or it's some drugs you can take. Whatever drugs he's taken, I'm telling you, only the president can get those. It's either the brain or the drugs where it's like, hey, we have this brain that we can put in Joe Biden before he gives any type of public speech, public, uh, public appearance in general. But we're only going to use this when it truly matters. We're going to use it for the State of the Union address. We're going to use it for any debates against Trump. And we're going to use it on election night for, you know, final statements and stuff like that. Everything else, we're going to give him this other brain where people are going to think he's dumb and slow. People are going to see him fall down sometimes. Oh, he doesn't have any motor skills. Oh, he can't really talk straight. But that's that other brain. Sure, it might be conspiracy, but it's the same thing as drugs, right? Where it's like, oh, he took what? Because there is no way that the same guy that I watched on TV fall down, mispronounce stuff, confuse black people with each other, confuse uh, natural disasters, confuse hurricanes with COVID, and vaccination. There's no way that guy gave that speech. There's no way he gave that speech. But look, am I excited for this election year? No, not at all. I think politics just make people fight each other. They take, you know, give you a side to take and then people just brawl it out over things that we have no control over. So that's always fun, you know? So we'll see what happens there. One more thing I'm going to add in is it's the four year anniversary of COVID starting. The official lockdown weekend, I remember, was right around this time. I was in Chicago for St. Patrick's Day, and it was the one year that they didn't color the river. Well, it was the first year they didn't color the river. I don't know if they did in 2021 or 22, but they didn't color the river. And, you know, I was like, oh, everyone's freaking out about this flu. Everyone's freaking about this flu. Like, it's not that big of a deal. And I remember flying back, and that Sunday that we woke up after all the festivities, They shut everything down. Hey, we're going into lockdown. You start getting the corporate emails where it's like, hey, everyone just work from home. If you don't don't have a laptop, you'll be given a time to come in to grab it. And then you go to the airport, you see everyone wearing masks. And the next thing you know, it was a beautiful time. Aside from everyone dying, it was a beautiful time. You're staying at home, painting some walls, doing some laundry. You get furloughed. Oh, I don't, I only work two weeks in the month. Yeah. You know, sorry, sorry that, you know, we had to do this to you. Like, but it's just, you know, we need other people to be working. Right. Oh, that's fine. The government's giving me $600 a week for every week of unemployment. In addition to that, I'm going to get this $1,200 stimulus check. I'm going to get another stimulus check after that. I'm going to stay at home. Honestly, go a little crazy because I don't have anything to do and I can't really hang out with anyone. And I'm going to kick it. I'm going to play video games all day. I'm not going to really spend any money. I might order some Uber Eats, but it'll come in some bag. 
Oh, make sure you Clorox wipe it. It was a good time. It was a good time. I got into a relationship during COVID. That relationship is now where it's at as a fiance. It wasn't a bad time. But I'm good of not having it again, you know? I feel like I have talked your ear off enough about my stuff. So with that all being said, ladies and gentlemen, do not forget to comment, like, subscribe. If you're listening to this right now, share it with a friend. Uh, watch it on YouTube. Share the clips. Follow me on TikTok. I'm trying to change up the strategy a bit, you know, trying to change up how things are released. How can I go about maintaining a higher average episode viewer ratio? I don't even know what that means, but you know what I'm saying. I'm trying to change the game so it's a little bit more enticing to catch episodes. I know everyone's busy with their stuff. It is what it is. It's all good. If you're listening to this, please stop apologizing for, oh, I haven't caught up in the last two. It's a weird thing that has now become, oh, you know what? Sorry, I didn't hear your. It's okay. You don't need, you don't need to tell me that. You don't need to tell me that. It is perfectly fine. In addition to that, I want to start my Patreon channel which will be a channel of basically exclusive episodes where things will be a little bit more uh, uncensored, I guess. You know, like it'll be much more straightforward thoughts, maybe have a drink, just go at it, you know? So with that being said, I will release my first Patreon episode this Friday. It's upcoming Friday. I will release my first Patreon episode. Will I stay on Patreon? I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out the whole game of whether you should just have Apple subscribers or Patreon, but I know a lot of people that listen, mainly listen on Spotify. So I'm still trying to figure all of that out. With that all being said, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again. I'll see you next week and goodbye.